Part of what we do is show that, again, this completely ideologically corrupted corporate media narrative about Jacob Blake was not just wrong. I've taken to calling it anti-truth. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter. Well, those of you who follow the show know that uh, we just presented, we just published a video essay called The Death of Truth. And in that essay, I talk about the distinction between my truth and objective truth and post-truth. And today we have uh, uh, an exciting uh, filmmaker named Rob Muntz. He's American. And he's actually using documentary film. He started his own company. He's producing his own uh, movies that really focus on this and, and, and the, the importance of truth in the culture. So Rob Montz, thank you very much for being with us today in Grey Matter. It's a pleasure to have you on as our special guest. Thanks for having me. Okay. So Rob, uh, Rob is a filmmaker, as I said. He's CEO of something called Good Kid Productions, which he created. And uh, he's also created a number of really, really interesting documentary uh, films that have attracted millions of, of views. Um, and uh, he's had coverage in the New York Times, a former newspaper, the Washington Post, The Economist, USA Today, and The Megyn Kelly Show. Uh, he's a graduate of Brown University with a degree in philosophy. And he says precisely zero marketable skills. Well, apparently you've, you've, you've debunked that, Rob. Uh, apparently your skills are quite marketable. <laughs> debatable, debatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, somehow he ended up living on a 50-acre farm in the Virginia woods with the wife and three children. So maybe, Rob, we could start there. Obviously, um, you're very very well-educated, maybe over-educated out of Brown. So how did you become sort of a libertarian-leaning uh, you know, filmmaker? And, and how did you end up on a 50-acre farm in the Virginia woods? Well, I don't want to overstate the level of intentionality that got us to this place, right? Uh, it was more that about 18 months after graduating, I finally confronted the deep, deep existential truth that I'd spent most of my life ignoring, which is that I didn't know what to do with myself. And uh, I was unsatisfied with the current position that I was in, which is in, in America, at least, if you have an excessive amount of credentials and you're kind of vaguely ambitious and you move to Washington, D.C., 99% of the time you end up in corporate communications because mm. that's where the ambitious people with excessive degrees but no hard skills go to make some money, right? Mm -hmm. I can't fix anything. I don't have I don't have any science degrees. I'm not going to make any uh, biotherapeutics, but I can make some words that are going to be compelling to people. And the job that I had uh, was a corporate communication shop that I wouldn't say it stirred my soul. Didn't uh, I didn't find it particularly satisfying but I had absolutely no idea what to do. And the only advice I was getting from all the people around me and other people that were in a similar position that were in a ex similar existential rut was to go to law school. It's like, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I feel like, it sh I feel like I should be, ought to be more intentional. And I had always loved film. I'd loved documentaries. Um, and I didn't want to go to school. So I, and so I, I ended up applying for a very small fellowship uh, with a libertarian nonprofit. And specifically the idea was I was going to make my first film and teach myself film while I was doing it. And again, one of my great advantages is that I'm blindly self-confident and completely overly optimistic about my own skill set, which sometimes that can be a great asset. Sometimes it can be a great liability. In this particular instance, it ended up being an asset because I decided what I wanted to do was pick apart the North Korean propaganda apparatus. I'd always been fascinated by North Korea, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one of the central mysteries of the North Korean regime is that every couple of years, all the smart foreign policy pundits in America predict its imminent collapse. And for decades now, North Korea has been defying those predictions. And it's interesting, mm -hmm. like I always thought like, why is that? And anyway, over the course of the documentary, talking to a bunch of experts and actually traveling to North Korea myself about 10 years ago, I spent 10 days there filming in Pyongyang, you figure out that um, 
one of the essential elements of the regime's resilience is its propaganda apparatus, its ability to tell a certain story to its right. population mm -hmm. that does actually elicit a sense of organic loyalty to the regime. Right. And that did well enough. I mean, I'm embarrassed about it now, technically, because I didn't know what I was doing. But I think that actually set the paradigm that I've been iterating off of ever since, which is trying provocative, contrarian, story-based analysis that's, vis that's meant to be kind of visually and aesthetically propulsive, tackling topics other people won't tackle, but with a level of ideally, you know, emotional sophistication and storytelling ability that hits both the head and the heart. That's the idea. That's the aim. That's the ambition. So how did you get started with Good Kid? And where does Good Kid come from? It's an interesting title. Uh, well, <laughs> it's a... Uh, I had done well enough freelancing for YouTube channels that I we got the opportunity to start our own channel with our own production company. So all the all the documentaries we're going to talk about now mm -hmm. are available on the Good Kid Productions YouTube channel. Okay, and uh, it's meant to be. It's kind of a, a, a ironic double meaning, where to a certain extent, because of our you know reasonably described conservative politics we do believe in abiding by the script one inherits about the good life right it turns out all the boring cliched advice you receive from grandma grandpa about like work hard engage in a faith community invest in your friends invest in a family that that formula for human flourishing has been tested over eons and is correct. <laughs> and is it wow. absolutely correct, bro? Right? <laughs> so on so one hand, you do want to be good. On yeah. the other hand, if down in America, and it's even worse in Canada, we are in active rebellion against the dominant political orthodoxy, at least in the elite corridors, right? At least right. at Brown University yeah. and other elite in Washington, D.C., New York City. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So in a certain sense, we're not we're not very good. I mean, not to put too fine of a point on it, but we're not good. We're not good. And we don't we question the conceptual framework that defines good in these spaces. And mm -hmm. part of what we try to do is pick that apart and deconstruct it. Yeah. So that's my excessively literal interpretation of the name of our company. That's a great introduction to, <laughs> to your uh, documentaries. And it actually aids my understanding of them, deepens my understanding of them. Uh, so let's start with uh, the one that let's talk about the presidency of the United States. And uh, on this show, we we sort of set things up with aphorisms. So I've got a, couple, a few from presidents. One is from uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, he wrote something a long time ago. You probably heard this, Rob, uh, or read this, that the two enemies of the people are criminals and government. So let us tie the second down with the chains of the Constitution so the second will not become the legalized version of the first. And I could say that that seems to apply very much to what's going on with the Democrats in Washington, and it definitely applies with what's going on in, in Canada and with our federal government. Now, let's turn to a modern uh, president who you uh, made a film about. Uh, Donald Trump, he said, leaders, true leaders, take responsibility for the success of the team and understand that they must also take responsibility for the failure. Let's talk about the presidency. Um, you, you, you made this film several years ago on the power of the presidency. It's called Trump as Destiny, Why the Reality Show Presidency Was Inevitable. You want to talk about that a little bit? Why, first of all, the, about, about the title and what's, what's the concept of the film and what, what were you trying to present in that documentary? What's the thesis of it? Modern Americans would not be able to recognize what the presidency was intended to be in our founding, right? I mean, it's not surprising that a group of these Enlightenment era hyper rationalist American rebels, when they're setting up the back end programming for this new government, after having just thrown off the chains of imperial Great Britain, built in a lot of protections to ensure they would never have a king again by right. design, never mm -hmm. have a king again, no kings. The whole idea with America is that it's not a utopian project. It doesn't have some naive conception of human beings as infinitely perfectible or any human as perfectible. Everybody's flawed. Everybody has the worst angels of their nature. Build systems to account for what human nature is, not what you wish it would be, right? 
And so by that, the way that they designed the presidency is actually remarkably limited in what it's its powers. Right. It's the chief executive officer, but it's mostly there as um as a check against the popular passions of Congress, which is supposed to be the organ of government that does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to legislation, because mm -hmm. that's also the most democratically sensitive organ in our, you know, our tripart American federal system. Right. And what this what the documentary does is it shows how and why and who pushed the presidency from that, which is an extremely modest conception of what this office is to what it's become today, which is like all purpose, God, King, CEO of the economy, savior of the national soul, um, your best friend or your worst enemy, the devil. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's like moronically mythic language that's attached to people, even boring presidents like Biden, like what we got now. But right. when I made that doc, it was in the heyday I was still in Washington, D.C., and the city was still reverberating, traumatically reverberating from the election of Donald Trump. And all the headlines were about how this was completely unprecedented, that we've never seen anyone like this before. And then if you picked it apart a little bit, though, Trump at the time was extremely good at selling himself as a savior. I mean, he very famously said, I alone can fix it. Right. He talks about how the nation's doomed if he doesn't get elected. And far from being anomalous rhetorical excesses, that to me felt completely in line with the way that his predecessors of both parties had sold themselves as well. Like you want to look at Barack Obama's uh, <laughs> rhetorical legacy mm -hmm. and you're going to call it like, was Obama defined by a modest or moderate conception of the presidency? Of course not. And part of what you're trying to, the doc is about is, it's extremely unhealthy to infuse that much mythic energy into this office of one man because it doesn't have the normal checks and balances. Now, the ultimate irony is this. Now we're at the, the conclusion, you know, where, where we've seen the four years, the first four years, I don't know, of the Trump <laughs> presidency. And while being rhetorically maximalist and how Trump talked about himself, he actually was one of the least aggressive users of executive authority of the last hundred years, which is very interesting, mm. both in terms of the formal uses of the power, but also any attempts for the White House to sort of annex powers that are duly accorded to other chambers. A lot of the time, I mean, I'm not the first person to point this out. Trump, it seemed like he would he was operating as if he wasn't president. It was like he was just a yeah. commenter on Twitter. So we've talked about about one of your films about the presidency. So by way of segue, I want to talk next about this film uh, that you made about the Harvard professor, the, the uh, and and how uh, really he was uh, he was uh, mistreated at Harvard. Um, uh, in fact, you wrote a piece uh, last year uh, entitled "Harvard Cancel Cancelled Its Best Black Professor." Why uh, you want to talk about about uh, about this project and and why you did why you approach it from that point of view? Yeah, it's a dude named Roland Fryer who. He's born to a, um, he's abandoned by his mom at birth, born into poverty in small town Florida. His dad goes to prison for sexual assault when Roland is in high school. A bunch of Roland's friends fall into the drug trade and go to prison when he's in high school. He, Roland barely makes it to college. And then within a matter of years, he becomes the youngest tenured black professor in the history of Harvard University. That's the that's the hero's journey of our yeah. man Roland, right? Incredible, yes. And at Roland is just not a particularly political person. He is a genius economic mind. And once he got tenure, he basically did what you're supposed to do if you're a genius like him, which is take your brain and your resources and throw them at the most difficult, vexing, provocative questions of race in America and see what the answers are, right? And he did this, and he repeatedly found things that burst the neat progressive pieties that dominate a place like Harvard University. And because Roland's not a, he just reported them. It's right. <laughs> like, this is what I found. Right. This is what I found about the reality of acting white in American high schools, which is where high, academically high achieving black students are castigated by their black friends for being race traitors for doing well in their homework. Mm -hmm. Roland looks into it. There's one thing for me to say it. It's one thing for Charles Murray right. to say it. You could just dismiss him as like, oh, it's like a crotchety white white conservative. 
when Roland Fryer says it, when our man who has like all the street cred you could ever imagine says it, you're like, ah, shit, I can't do that anymore. This might right. actually be true. Mm -hmm. And he he released a, a series of just bombshell academic investigations that happened to be highly problematic in the kind of woke spaces he operated in. And then a couple of years ago, his career suddenly cut short. And the standard narrative set by the New York Times chiefly is that Roland was a just vicious sexual predator and he's found guilty of sexual harassment and he's duly punished by Harvard. And the punishment Roland receives is basically the worst possible thing you can do to someone if they have tenure. So in America, I don't know what the academic system is in right. Canada, it's but similar. in America, you can earn yeah. tenure, which essentially gives you a guarantee of a job for life if you're right. a really elite academic, which which Roland had at the time. Yeah. But they did everything else you're allowed to do to someone who has those protections, which is kick him off campus for a couple of years. They liquidated his lab. They shut it down. They took all of his money. They stigmatized him in his profession. They made him basically unhirable anywhere else. And that was that. That was the punishment. Yeah. And that was the narrative for a little bit. And I had gotten some hints that perhaps the story was not what it appeared to be. And in our documentary, we show that the story is not what it appears to be. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah. So what does that say about the truth of the critical race theory, the Robin D'Angelo Ibram X. Kendi version of critical race theory in America, in, in the West? What does that, what does that do? Is it, does it, debunk it or does it show how toxic it can be uh when it's when it's applied and when it's misapplied what i could just thoughts? i could i feel like i can speculate as to what roman fryer thinks about critical race theory okay which is it posits that black people are helpless passive victims in right. need of, of white saviors any problem they have is because of white outsiders and any solutions to their problems need to be given to them by white outsiders right right their salvation has to come from outside. Right. And all and B, critical race theory is mostly uh, intell pure intellectual masturbation, completely unconcerned with the material well-being of actual black people. Yeah. It's an intellectual fad that, you know, tenured professors have the luxury of indulging in indefinitely, particularly the white professors. They can indulge in this garbage. To, to you know to, to perform their allyship to to show that they're a good white person and their black colleagues can dutifully receive this wonderful self-sacrificial love from this white ally and meanwhile the kids of Harlem or the kids of Chicago or the black kids of Richmond year after year after year still get failed by their schools, failed by their parents, failed by their communities, and are stuck at endless loops of poverty and violent dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he would say. This is a mm -hmm. this is an irrelevant yeah. intellectual fad. The other thing that I got out of the out of that uh, documentary is that the left really doesn't care about black people. It, it it can't care about black people because if it did, then it wouldn't it would never even consider tearing down somebody as exemplary as as Dr. Fryer. Uh, why would you tear down something like that? I, I mean, he's an example of, he's a shining example of what you'd want young black kids to, to be, you know, uh, in, in terms of if they were going to maximize their individual possibilities, to work hard, uh, to be honest, to be truthful, to be ethical, to be principled. Uh, it, it seems to me if they really cared about black people, they would never want to tear somebody like him down. Would you agree? Right. But what if your status as a tenured professor at Harvard is dependent upon the problems of the black community never getting solved? Right. Yes. That's it. It's like yes. some jerk the parable like Larry of the Bobo. Tarantula. Part of yeah. right, part of part of his moral authority comes from the idea that black people are perpetually victimized. Right. And that institutional racism is everywhere. And it's basically insurmountable. And if it's insurmountable, right. then Larry Bobo gets to go give TED Talks indefinitely about institutional racism. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, Can't be fixed. So that's a great segue into your next film I want to talk right. about. Let's talk about The Broken Boys of Kenosha. Obviously, every, everyone's eyes, uh, I mean, certainly in, in the United States and in Canada, were just riveted to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial not so long ago. And you made this really interesting 
documentary about the Broken Boys of Kenosha. What drew you to that story and why did you think that was important to document it? Right. So we're right. That's exactly. We're in this 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 uh, lockdown, pressurized racial justice moment of the summer of 2020. And a week after George Floyd, this guy named Jacob Blake gets shot by a police officer on the north side of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is like a small bedroom community, gets shot by a white police officer and someone captures the shooting on a cell phone that like eight second snippet gets uploaded to some social network and instantly goes viral. And it it's not an organic virality, virality though. It's every elite coastal mainstream corporate media institution other than like Fox News was desperate to find the next George Floyd. They want, they're oh, desperate yes. for it. They're right. fiending for it. They're craving for it, right? Because mm. they're in this moment of grand racial reckoning and tens of thousands of people is taking to the street to denounce America's horrible institutional racism. And they basically convince the majority of the country that this clip, the shooting, is George Floyd 2.0. And as a result, 6,000 outside protesters descend on Kenosha and over the course of three nights incinerate large portions of the city on that after that on that third night that's the night that Kyle Rittenhouse comes down Mm -hmm. he picks up an AR-15 in a medic bag and goes to Kenosha to protect a used car dealership so these two mega viral news incidences are intimately intertwined and Kenosha has this rare distinction of being a, a place that birthed two mega viral news incidences in the matter of just 72 hours, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And part of what we do is show that, again, this completely ideologically corrupted corporate media narrative about Jacob Blake was not just wrong. I've taken to calling it anti-truth because they so flagrantly misrepresented what happened, both within those seven seconds of the viral news clip and the two minutes before and the two minutes after, the things that didn't make the frame, that if you're an outside observer, you would draw the exact wrong lessons as to what needed to be done to improve the lives of both Jacob Blake and his kids, right? right? But we also hit the right because I think there was an overreaction on the right side of the political spectrum. And for when Kyle Rittenhouse goes down, it becomes just kind of enforced orthodoxy that Kyle Rittenhouse is nothing other than a Second Amendment martyr. He is... He's like a this baby-faced gun right activist who is a true American patriot and was just there to protect private property. And anything, if you say anything other than that, you must be like a neo-Marxist, non-binary, you know, trans woke <laughs> activist, right? And both of those neat partisan narratives missed the true tragedy of what happened in Kenosha. And what we found was this shared trauma between both Jacob Blake, Kyle Rittenhouse. And two, the, basically the two other main characters of the Kenosha tragedy. Mm-hmm. And we can get into it if you want. I mean, but that's the... Uh, well, let's get into it. I'm interested. This, this, this is very So I don't want to give stuff. away too much. I want to, you know, I want to okay, intrigue the audience to watch. But fair enough. I'll say this. In America, one out of every three boys is raised without a dad. It's substantially it's worse, higher it's than... It's worse in black communities, right? It is worse in black yeah. communities, but it's very bad in white communities as well, which yeah. tends to get overlooked in conservative mm-hmm. spaces, right? Mm-hmm. And he, uh, we're tied with the UK for the highest rate in the world in terms of rates of fatherless boys. Really? And wow. there's emerging neuroscience that substantiates kind of common sense about the importance of dads in a young boy's life, particularly during adolescence, where dads tend to be like the externalized... Like literally young boys do not have the neural networks yet to properly control. And they get they get flooded with this testosterone that makes them want to go conquer and do heroic things, which properly channeled leads to excellence, right? Right. Improperly channeled, if it's not properly tempered by some sort of outside common sense controls, it can lead to violent chaos, all right? right. Mm-hmm. Kyle Rittenhouse didn't have a dad. Jacob Blake didn't have a dad. The two other main characters of Kenosha did not have dads. And what overtook Kenosha in the summer of 2020? Violent chaos. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Interesting. Yeah, that's well stated. This has been wonderful, Rob. I know that uh, we only have so much of your time 
we, uh, we, we usually finish off with something called the reading list. And I've chosen a couple books. I read that you were uh, uh, something of a, of a fan or an acolyte of Charles Murray, who is obviously controversial, uh, but mostly correct, in my opinion. Uh, so a couple of books of his. One is called uh, Human Diversity, The Biology of Gender, Race, and, and Class. This is a very interesting book. The second book is also one of uh, uh, Charles Murray's. It's called What It Means to Be a Libertarian, A Personal Interpretation. Uh, and uh, here he says that it, the description is he combines the tenets of classical libertarian philosophy, of which you're obviously uh, a fan, with his own highly original, always provocative thinking. Murray shows why less government advances individual happiness and promotes more vital communities and a richer culture. So, Rob, if you wouldn't mind, would you would you uh, mind leaving our viewers with uh, a, a selection of whether it's a film or a movie or, or, or a website or a book that you think uh, would help our viewers uh, maybe advance their understanding of some of the topics you've been talking with us today? You know what they should read is my favorite Charles Murray book is his least famous. It's his book called Real Education. Ah. And we actually got a chance to interview him on the channel about it as well. It's the most popular interview we've done because I think it really strikes a nerve. And what it does, it kind of, it, it, it avoids most of the issues of his that tend to get him in trouble. And it's just like, he basically says, here is what we know definitively scientifically about IQ, what it is, where it comes from, its degree of malleability. Right. And what he shows in very careful, precise, but kind of devastating Charles Murray prose is that taking the science of IQ seriously requires radically re-envisioning K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of K through 12 is built on some dangerously optimistic and naive conceptions of human intelligence. And he hints at some solutions, but the book ends, it will convince you that K through 12, I think in both of our countries, is premised on a series of very dangerous and counterproductive lies yeah. and, and, and false assumptions. Yeah. Well, Rob, this has been just wonderful. I'm so grateful for your time. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today, Rob, and best of, of luck in your future projects. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.